Okay, we're going to start. The session here is titled Common Operational Pitfalls and How to Avoid Them. So, in truth, if someone says in truth, that means still not they were lying. But it would be impossible to really sit here and in 40 minutes tell you all the pitfalls that you're going to encounter in starting a new business and how to deal with all of them. It would be practically impossible. You would need a little bit more than 40 minutes. I think more like 50, 55 minutes. But what I would like to do over here tonight is I will pick several topics that are probably the most important. At least you should be aware of them and in a general way how to approach them so you can actually walk away with something meaningful. Can you hear me good in the back? Without the mic, good. So you can actually walk away with something meaningful and be able to use that to take it further. You're not going to walk out from here just knowing exactly what to do about everything, but it will give you at least to open your mind to maybe look at things slightly differently, hopefully, and to be able to approach them in a, in a real way and in a practical way rather than just know, oh, these are problems that I encounter, what do I do about them? In general, anyone who opens a business will encounter pitfalls. That's why you're all sitting here, because you all encounter pitfalls, or you know you're going to encounter pitfalls. I'm going to ask, I'm going to volunteer, instead of me listing the hundred pitfalls that you all are going to challenge, if I could have two or three volunteers just Raise your hand and tell me one pitfall that you think that I should focus on, and if I think that it applies to uh, many people in the room, I'll, I'll focus on that. So I'll take a volunteer, two or three volunteers, just raise your hand and tell me what would be the most common pitfalls. Product selection. Product selection. So that's a challenge, not a pitfall. What this gentleman said was product selection. I wouldn't necessarily um, fit that into a list of pitfalls. I think that's just in running your business, you decided that you want to sell on a platform rather than go into a certain business. You didn't, you didn't decide you're going into a category, you said I want to sell on a platform such as Amazon probably or eBay, and now I don't know what to sell. So that's, okay, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll start with that one also. What was yours? Getting more important what you're doing, not focusing, not getting to, uh, to, to grow your business, like to, to the next. Uh... Okay, so this gentleman said over here that one of the common pitfalls is, is, is getting caught up in the day-to-day -day operations of your business and not focusing on what your business really should be doing. Okay, two very common ones. I need one more. Yeah. Direction. So specifically, whether you're retelling or wholesaling and dabbling, both of them, I'm not sure exactly which uh, direction you So want that, to that is very similar to what this gentleman said was. Selection of products would go into more of a broader, the same thing. What am I doing? I'd like to be in business, but what direction am I taking? So wholesale versus retail is basically a lack of clarity and direction. I want to be in business, but I'm not exactly sure. I don't clearly have a plan. It would sort of fall under the same category, so I'm going to take one more because those two are the same. Yeah. Hiring. Hiring. Wrong. Hiring the wrong people. Very good, but I'm going to change that a little bit. I'm going to say hiring is the biggest pitfalls. Is one of the biggest pitfalls you run into in the hiring process. Even if you're hiring the right people, you could be hiring them in the wrong way, or for the wrong salaries, or hiring them wrong. So it's not just hiring the right people; it's hiring. You can hire the right person and hire them wrong also. Or you can hire the wrong person and the most and follow all the rules. So we think these three, these three topics, and I'm actually going to address them one at a time. So we said like this. We said a pitfall is, is you want to be in business, but you have a lack of clarity and direction. What to do, who to sell to, what to sell. That's one. The other one is, is getting caught up in the day-to-day -day operations of the business and forgetting about the bigger picture of the business, and hiring. All these three are actually very common, and they're really tied together. 
I'm going to split the two parts of running a business and everything you can split in different ways. So it's, you know, it's not textbook that has to be split like this or like that. But there's two parts in general, A and B, of running a business. And generally, a lot of times you'll actually see two partners in a business where one does one, one does the other. I'm not advocating partnerships necessarily. I'm just saying a lot of times you find two partners that do these two things, or you hire a key employee that does the other part that you don't do well or don't like to do. And one of them is you have a vision. You have a vision. You want to do the business. You want to, do, you want to have a certain type of business. And the second part of the business, which is equally important, is the operations of the business. The operations could be many, many things. Not enough time to go through every single one of them. But they will be infrastructure. Infrastructure means facilities, computer systems, ways how to, op how to operate. That's called infrastructure. Cash, managing cash flow. That means having cash, having somebody worry about a cash. Uh, bookkeeping systems, just systems to keep track of your cash. And, and, and generally keeping books, cash and keeping books. Um, the other one is, is personnel and labor and hiring hiring people, when to hire people, and hiring people, but those are all operational, operational functions. Computer systems, functions, uh, office supplies, functions, um, all these things, um, opening up bank accounts, functions, um, you know, making a deal with the transportation company, functions, opening up um, business relationships, contracts, for example. So if you're opening up an Amazon account, you know, actually going through the setup process. That's process. It has nothing to do with buying and selling an actually underlying business. So if you had to split these two, I want between vision of what you want to do in your business and the nuts and bolts of the business, if you have one versus the other, I'm going to sort of see how some of you think. What's worse? Not to have the vision, the direction of the business, of what the business is going to do, or not to have the nuts and bolts in the operations of the business. Which is worse? If somebody may want to give a stab at this and tell me which one is worse and you'll have to back it up with a why. They're both pretty bad, I know that. <laughs> which one is worse not to have? Huh? Yeah. Okay, so you're saying is this that if you have a vision and you don't have the nuts and bolts of the business, it's not as bad as if you have a vision, you just don't have what it takes to run a business. Very good. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, yeah? You can technically hire someone for nuts and bolts. You can't hire someone for vision. So you're saying the same thing. You're saying is if you have no vision in your business, then you have no, even if you put the operation together 100%, you don't have a business. Whereas if you have a vision how to run your business, but you don't have the nuts and bolts, you can always solve it. So on that level, you are right, you're both right, that not having a vision to what you want to do in business, which would be, you know, what do I want to do in general, or even narrowing it down, what's my specialty, why my business, what am I bringing to the market? I know I want to open, an, again, a lot of you guys on Amazon, and not whatever, but I hear the questions. You're opening up an Amazon account, what am I going to sell for? I like this product line, should I sell wholesale, retail? That's a lack of clarity and vision and you don't know why you're going to be in business. If you know that, but you don't have what it takes to run a business, I will tell you that they're equally bad. Yes, you can figure out how to get the nuts and bolts of the, and the operations of the business. You can hire someone, so to speak, or bring in a partner if you had a vision. But overall, if you had a business with one, without the other, it's equally, equally disastrous. You don't have a business. And I will preface, I will answer the question is, is one of the biggest pitfalls of a business is if you don't recognize that. That's all. You don't have to have the solutions to that. If you go into a business and you say, I have a great idea, it's a brilliant idea, I'm going to sell this product or service to the market, there's a need for it, or I'll create a need for it, and this is how I'm going to get it to the market but you have no idea how to run this business, the operations of the business, it is the biggest pitfall of the business. When you go into that business, you are headed for disaster, 
and you're going to close it faster than you're going to open it. Now, that doesn't mean that some people don't figure it out fast enough, but that's already relying on miracles. If you go into a business and you do not have a clue, you don't have at least some form of plan, it doesn't have to be a 50-page business plan, double typed and spaced and checked by your accountant and your lawyers. No, it doesn't. But if you have no idea how you're going to run this business, then you don't have a business. The biggest pitfall, I would say number one, I don't have a whiteboard here, I would have written it here, I didn't prepare a whiteboard. Pitfall number one is, you're going to walk away remembering it. If I see you on the street in a few days, I'm going to ask you, pitfall number one, and you're going to tell me what it is. Pitfall number one is having a great idea. Not only a great idea, let's even take it further. You actually are starting to run this business. You've tested it. It's not just in concept. You've started it. And you have absolutely no plan, nothing in place, how to run the business, the nuts and bolts, the processes of the business, the infrastructure of the business. That is the biggest pitfall that you can have. The flip side of it is, pitfall number two, which is equally disastrous, or maybe even worse. You have a great idea. You start your business, but then you don't really enjoy that business. For example, let's say that you have to sell a product. You have a great product or service, but you just, you're not the type of person, you're not a natural salesperson. You're not outgoing. You, you don't have the courage when you call someone to sell them something, you're hoping they don't pick up the phone. And you had that feeling sometimes, you're a salesperson, right? And you hope the other side doesn't pick up the phone, like, why are you calling? You know, hope, and if they do pick up the phone, you hope they're gonna be nice to you, you know how it is, you, you, right? You don't like that. So what happens is, pitfall number two, is what this gentleman said before, is that you start your business, but now you need to order office supplies and uh, computers and desks and shipping stuff and uh, whatever it is it takes and the bank accounts and the lawyers and, and you suddenly start enjoying every minute of it. You enjoy going to Staples and buying your first box of supplies or buying it on Amazon. You enjoy signing that first lease. You're doing it well. You're, the lease is, you took it to the lawyer and you six drafts and you got it right and you hired the right lawyer and then you, you did all those things right and you got caught up in those things because you're enjoying them and you're doing them very well. You're a good operations guy. If you were working for someone else and you were his operations person, this person would be a very lucky person. But you, having this, are the most unlucky person because you're getting caught up in the things that are very important, very important but you have no business. And you're sort of, you're, you're, you're trending towards them. You you're, you're get up in the morning and you're worrying about those things, not what am I doing and how am I going to run my business. And so it is equally, equally important when you approach a business, and a lot of people make this mistake, and this, the numbers prove it. Most businesses, most, I don't have to, I'm not gonna start telling you fancy statistics, most businesses that are started in the United States go out of business in the first year. Most, meaning like 80, 90, not like 51%. Usually, it's because of this. It's one of these two things. Either the business, it's a great vision, has absolutely no infrastructure for one of many reasons. It just takes one. You're only as strong as your weakest link. You can have excellent cash flow, you can be well funded, but you don't have computer systems, you don't, whatever it might be. You don't have any of those things, they go out of business. Flip it the other way around. You open up a fantastic operation. It is great. You want to go into the restaurant business, for example. I don't recommend it for anybody, by the way. You want to go into the restaurant business, or the catering business, and you go out there and you buy the most expensive kitchen and the best equipment, the confection oven, and the deep fryer, and the grill. And you buy top, top notch. And you go out there, and you buy the best food, and you hire the top chef. But nobody knows about you. You're not marketing your business. You're not attracting customers. So you have a very good operation, and you have no business. They're equally detrimental. So if you walk away with one thing today, one thing today knowing that if you actually want to go into business, be honest with yourself.
do I have the ability to actually go on both tracks? Do I really, really know what I'm doing? Do I really have a plan to go through and have a clear vision of what my business is going to do and why? Why people should buy my product or service? And if yes, number two, equally, do I have the ability to hold to put this all together? And if not, what am I going to do about it? That's okay. Some people love one area and recognize the fact that they may not be excellent in the other area. And what's my plan? To hire somebody, to bring somebody in, and do I have at least the aptitude, do I have the skill set to manage that one person or to be partners with that one person? Even that much. Because a lot of people don't like to communicate with others. They're loners. They like to be, you know, in charge. But you can't, those two skills just don't go together. So that's, I would say, pitfall number one, that if you actually can address it and realize it and recognize it, that's why, by the way, there are a lot of people who have one of these skills, one of these qualifications, look around and you will see they are working for other people. Sometimes they're making even a very good living. They're well paid, well compensated. They could be working in a big company or they could work in a smaller company and just making a good living doing one or the other. For example, you can see that there are excellent um, um, lawyers, but they don't work for themselves. There are excellent lawyers. They could be top litigators or experts in a certain field. And they would be working for a large law firm. They may make, make, make a partner, but they're not on the law firm. They're not sole practitioners. And why is that? Because they love to litigate or they love to practice law. They hate the bookkeeping. They even have trouble keeping, you know, time cards and all of that. And they need somebody to, you know, maybe saying it into a recorder and someone else is typing it and following up. They hate some of the stuff that goes with running They hate a, a, a law firm. They hate managing other people. They hate all the other things that are the nuts and bolts of a business, but they're very, very good at what they do when they practice law. They're working for a major law firm and they're doing well because they recognize that this is their expertise. They can't do more than that. Whereas sometimes you will have a top lawyer in their industry who's actually a sole practitioner or the head of his own law firm, their own law firm, with a few other lawyers and they can manage all those other things also because they, have been, they know that they can be good or have figured out how to do the operations aspect of it. Flip it the other way. There are some people, you watch them in certain businesses or organizations, who are excellent operations people. They take all the boring details that you hate to do. They take all of those and they take care of them and they make sure that you are involved as much as you need to be involved and they keep you out of it as much as they can keep you out of it. And those are excellent, excellent operations people. And some of those people can even be high up in big businesses, COOs, presidents of companies, who run things but don't have the capacity to actually have a vision of to buy and sell products or services or to take a company to another level, which is what visionaries do in businesses. And so you can watch, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to do one versus the other. If you are going to go into business, and call a kavod, go for it. Just recognize that you need to have both these tracks, and either you're gonna be good at both of them, usually we're not, we're gonna be good at one over the other, we're going to figure out how we're going to supplement and complement ourselves and do that other part. And like I said before, it could be in multiple different ways. It could be with a spouse, not very recommended, but, you do find husband and wife businesses that run extremely well. It's just, there's a challenge to it because, you know, the separation of home and businesses. It does work sometimes. It does work. But that's where the two complement each other. Partners, partnerships, comes with its challenges. People have to get along with each other. And on the other hand, partnerships that work well, work extremely well. Each one recognizes their strengths, recognizes their weaknesses, and respects the other partner for those strengths that the other partner has. And the third option, obviously, is, which you need at least a skill set to be able to recognize it and hire the right people, and not only hire them, but recognize that those things are important. One, another, we'll put that as pitfall number three or four, is 
you hire somebody, and you hire the right person for this, an operations person, but you don't have, a t you don't have the patience for detail. You want to be buying and selling and wheeling and dealing, and you don't have the patience. Not only you hate to do it, but you hate to even deal with it. And so you have a person running after you and saying, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that. Oh, leave me alone. Like you're doing them a favor by even listening to them. They're working for you. They're trying to help and organize you. And so if you don't even have the patience to even work with someone like that, that person, if you were able to hire them, if you didn't turn them off by the interview process, they're going to leave you very, very fast by the first opportunity. And that's because you need to at least be able to manage and recognize that you need to manage someone who's going to take care of the boring stuff. And the boring stuff is equally important and sometimes we don't even recognize how hard it is or what goes in to flawless operations. When you go and you experience a service, for example, wherever it is, whether it's an airline, a hotel, a restaurant, or any type of service that you, if everything goes smooth, then it's uneventful. It's fine. You give them, okay, great. I experienced it. It was good. When something goes wrong, we get very upset as consumers, and especially today on the internet, you get more negative reviews than you get positive reviews. One of the ways, for example, that uh, platforms like Amazon measure an account, they measure an account, it's called an ODR, order defective rate, and I think they're still using these, these, one of these metrics. What is an order defective rate? An order defective rate says like this, you shipped out a thousand orders, how many customers didn't complain? How many customers you didn't hear from? We consider that a positive experience. And so we weigh that. So if you have 100 negative complaints and zero positives, no one says, great, shipping was fast, I don't know, all these you know, positive reviews that you get. You got zero positive reviews. You just got 100 complaints. But you shipped out 100,000 orders. Your order defect rate is a fraction of a fraction. That means that all your customers were happy. What am I saying here? I'm saying is, is, is that usually, as human beings, we, we do that also, we always do that. When an experience is good, as expected, we don't recognize what went into that experience. We only realize and recognize the experience wasn't good when something goes wrong, and the smallest thing goes wrong. And so, just pick any example. You go to a hotel. If everything is flawless, the reception is standing there right when you walk in, no one online in front of you, suddenly three people come behind you online, suddenly a second person appears at the counter, so there's no wait for the second person, a few more people appear, a third person appears behind the counter, so there's no long wait, all those people are taken care of, everybody gets a room exactly where they want, facing the parking lot, facing the road, facing the pool, whatever it is, they get what they want. The room is spotless, impeccable, the soap is exactly in place, and the shampoo is in place, and there's enough towels, maybe an extra one. Everything is flawless. The mini bar is full. When you walked in, one light was on, the air conditioning or the heating was exactly set to perfect room temperature. All these little things, for example. Or someone actually sat down and actually thought about those things. Someone actually even thought about whether to fold the blanket in front of the pillow slightly over to make it look inviting or not. It didn't just happen by accident. It didn't just happen because whoever was servicing the room decided to put their personal touch on it. Because if you can check all the rooms, it's also going to have the folded blanket with a little mint or the chocolate on it. What, we what, I'm, what we're saying here is, is, is that these are all minute details in a huge picture of what it takes for a flawless operation and experience for a customer to take place. And of course, there are the bigger things. I'm just using the example of hotel, but it could be anything. To make sure that the air conditioning, the HVAC, for example, is perfect. Now, how often does an HVAC system break down? Not too often. But when it does, you have 100 hot guests or cold guests in the building. So someone who really thinks about the operation has a backup HVAC, just in case. Etc. 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 What we're talking about here is, is that when it comes to the operations, there are so many details that go into having your customer experience a flawless experience, down to the smallest detail, and that all. How much time? 
16? 17? I'm going to stop after 15 and mid-sentence. And if they say more, I'll continue. So down to those details. What I will focus now on, and so pitfall number three, we could say it is, is, is not the lack of appreciation for what it takes. You recognize that you need to have infrastructure, but you don't appreciate how important it is, at the same time not being over-focused on it at the expense of your business and not finding the right balance, just as detrimental. You have to recognize how important these things are. When you run a business, you have a vision. What and why. And that can change, by the way. I heard uh, someone read me a quote from Amazon the other day. The best plan is to have no plan. It doesn't mean really no plan. But it means don't lock yourself into one thing. You start a business, you have a vision, it's, it goes okay. It's not exactly what you thought. But usually, many times, if you, are, if you have an open mind and you have a broad vision, that will lead to five other things that you never thought of when you started. Have a vision, but be prepared to change and modify the vision as you move along. So you have to have the vision. At the same time, balance it carefully with building infrastructure. But don't be over busy saying, you know what, I need a great computer system and I need a great this and a great this and a great this, B building all those things. Give it its fair share. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit more, a little bit more. You build them both at the same time. Don't build a, 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 a huge infrastructure when your business is small. Even if your vision is big, build it small. Build it slightly more than what you need but not too much more because you're going to get too busy with it and it's going to cost you more than it should and it's kind of detriment you're not going to be able to see through your vision but don't underappreciate and don't underestimate what those things are I'm going to go through a few of those things, we have a few minutes left one of those things are is hiring people hiring people is the biggest step that any business takes. Going from zero to one employee is a bigger step than going from 100 employees to 1,000 employees. It's huge. Why is that? It's only one. It's one employee. Anybody here can explain it? Let's let it go. thinking here? Let's let it go. Very good. It's letting go, it's even more than letting go. It's changing our mindset. First I was a sole practitioner, now I'm an employer. It's learning how to be an employer. It's a separate skill set that you need to learn, you need to practice, you need to make mistakes and make sure that you fix those mistakes. And at the same time, while you're busy learning how to be an employer, not to let go of your business not to let go of your vision, and not to let go of the where is your business going and why am I in business. It is a delicate balance that you really need to manage. When you go to two employees, it also may be hard because you just doubled in size, but the biggest step is going from zero to one. It's a huge step from one to two, not like from 100 to 1,000, because when you have 100 employees, you probably have several managers in there or several people who are capable of training those other people and setting policies and teaching them what to do and setting expectations and all that. I'm not going to go into the details of what goes through to hiring a person. That could be separate 10 classes in itself. But recognizing that you, there is a point where you're going to need to hire someone, you may even make a little bit less money. You may be making in a great living. You may be making uh, enough to feed your family, but you want to grow, you're going to have to sacrifice some of those earnings. Make sure, of course, with proper cash flow planning that you can afford to do that and you can actually spend that money or you have a way to get the money from. But you're going to spend the money going to being an employer. More than spending the money on being an employer, you're going to invest in hiring the right person, training them properly, making sure that they're going to be understand their job and then not losing them and making sure that they have job satisfaction make sure it's harder to do that in a small setting than it is in a big setting even if you're giving the employee a 
attention and making him feel good, her, him or her feel good, and all of that. There's something about a bigger social environment in a company that has many different people that's on the same level, not the employer or employee. An employer and employee are parent, child, principal, student. Those are always going to be the relationships. And so as much as that person may enjoy working with you, it's still, it's a hierarchy, it's a chain of command. If you bring it, by the way, equal, you're doomed. Don't hire your best friend. Don't hire who you can't fire. You have to be able to start like this. And so what happens is, is, is that that person doesn't have the social environment that they would have in a bigger company. And eventually you move to more employees and you go to two or three or four. You try to hire people with similar backgrounds. Of course, not avoid, you know, avoiding any discrimination or anything like that. But you try to hire people from sort of same similar backgrounds, if you can, if those skill sets match. Because then what you're accomplishing is, is you're creating a social environment that is currency for employees. Employees don't come to work only for the money. Without the money, they're not showing up. But it's not always only about the money. It's a separate class, it's a separate uh, discipline, recognition, um, social environment, how close they are to work, how they get treated, do you recognize them when they do something good, you catch them doing something good, are you actually training them? Are they actually learning a skill? Are they actually feeling accomplished? You know, and all of those things. That. But go into the pitfalls. The pitfall is, is that not recognizing that the hiring and the training of your employee from number one or those employees, those first ones, needs a lot of attention and to be done right. If you don't hire correctly, you are doomed. You can't, it's hard to entangle yourself from it. It's hard to undo yourself from a bad situation that could have been prevented. And if you're not sure, you're not good at it, just consult with people. Find people who can be a sounding board for you. People who are a little bit more experienced in business and, may not, and are not your direct competitors. And you can discuss that. And many people will give you advice and tell you if you're the right direction or the wrong. It's not hard to do it if you recognize, the biggest step is recognizing that this is something that you just need to do right. Otherwise, it's going to be a pitfall, pitfall number four. One of the other pitfalls, and then I'll take your questions. One of the other pitfalls that people run into is the lack of appreciation for good record keeping. Good record keeping is invaluable. Even if it's a hundred dollar QuickBooks or basic record keeping, you should be able to know at any given time who did what and when. It was 10 cents or a million dollars. How and what, where the money came from, where the money went, how it was spent, why it was spent. Expensed properly, done properly. If you get over busy with it, then you're going to fall into the pitfall of being busy with your infrastructure and having perfect records, but no business. But a business without records is like a car without gas, without wheels. It is one of the worst mistakes that business people make going into a business underappreciating, underestimating how important it is to have good records. If you start out in the beginning with good clean records and just create yourself little systems, then you will be so thankful when you look back. For example, just picture yourself walking into a bank and saying, I want to apply for a small business loan of $100,000. Many banks can give it to you just on your credit score and a good a good business records, which is usually can be printed out from QuickBooks. So the bank manager will say, you have good credit, but I need to see your business records. Please give me your last two years of a balance sheet and your profit and loss statement and your cash flow. Print, give me those three things. If you can't go back to your office or even from your phone, generate those reports, 
and present it, and they should be meaningful and good, that's pitfall number five. And it's very easy to do. You do it in the beginning, you can do a web-based service, you can buy a CD of $100 or any QuickBooks or one of these similar services, and keep your records clean from the beginning. The first few transactions, you're going to remember it. It's like you remember where you were on the most important day of your life. You remember where you were when it was your, uh, you know, your 18th birthday. You remember when it was when, some, when you were at someone's wedding, your best friend's wedding. There are always mo moments you remember exactly where you were. The first check you write, you remember. Oh, check 101, you know, $70 to Verizon for the phone line or something, whatever. You remember that. But as you do your first 50 or 100 transactions, it becomes one big blur. And it should be. Because if you are very good at remembering check numbers and amounts, you're probably not good at something. You're not good at running a business. You're one of these geniuses that walks around and remembers license plates. So it's okay not to remember past transaction number 10. And at some point, it starts to become a blur. And it should become a blur because these are not so important. Big transactions, yes, it should be important. But if a customer calls you, and you're not 100% sure if they paid or not, that's okay. That's fine. But know that your records are exact. Know that when you check and tell, I don't see a payment posted over here, you say it with 100% confidence rather than, I don't think you paid me because I don't see the payment over here. You want to print out an accounts receivable at any given time. And you want to have your newly hired employee call up and collect that money you need to know that when that person prints out that report, it is accurate, and not only is the amounts are accurate, the invoice amount, the dates, what was shipped, tracking numbers, is perfect. So you know that you're out there running a business, and your bookkeeper or accounts receivable person is collecting and collecting perfectly, rather than, you know, um, the person I just called, they said they think they paid, or you misapplied the check, and blah, 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 blah. You know, wait, wait, I'll be back soon, and, and we'll work it out and figure it out. And we never figure it out, we don't get paid. And so, it is a huge pitfall, it maybe even belongs on the top, of underestimating what and how important it is to have basic record keeping in your business from day one, from transaction one. Even the $5,000 you borrow from your brother-in-law, book it as an entry, loan from brother-in-law, what a fool he was, and on the memo, and know where it came from and keep track of how you spent it. And also keep track of when you have to pay it back and you put it as a payable. 20 more minutes? We have enough pitfalls? There are a lot more. Any questions? The solutions for all these pitfalls are what I said before. Recognizing how important they are. The solution is secondary. If you recognize, if you're driving on the road and you see a big sign bump and you see a bump in front of you, a pothole, you recognized it. What you're going to do about it is almost irrelevant, almost insignificant which way you're going to go around. You're going to make a U-turn and go this way around, around it. The recognition of the importance of these things is most of it. What's going to follow is an action that's appropriate and proportionate to how important it is. The more significance and importance we give things, the more importantly we deal with it. For example, if you have an appointment somewhere, if it's a very important appointment, you come 15 minutes early. If it's so-so, you come exactly on time. If it's an appointment you're really not in the mood of, you might even come late. A little bit late. So everything that you do is, how important is this pitfall, problem, challenge? And if you recognize it, then it won't be a pitfall and it won't be a challenge. You're just going to do what you have to do. Got it? Any other questions? Well, I've solved all your problems. That's it? Scaling. Huh? Scaling. Scaling? All right, we have one more minute. So, scaling, I, I touched a little bit on it before. Scaling means is how do you grow your business? It's when you scale and you go up steps, right foot, left, right, you don't do both at the same time. You don't jump up the ladder. Like this, and like this, and like this. You do both at the same time. 
you expand your vision, you're going to get more customers, you have more ideas, more products, more services, or whatever. And at the same time, you move up a little bit on this side, you move your infrastructure up a little bit. Not, oh, I want to build my business big, let me go all the way and build the biggest warehouse and the biggest computer system. Proportionate. Don't get caught up, build it maybe a little bit bigger. So you moved up like this, you move your infrastructure like this. So you want to have room to grow a little bit. Now you're going to catch up and you're going to like this and you get a little stretched and your warehouse doesn't have enough room and you don't have enough, uh, you move it up a little bit like this and like this and like this. That's what we call scaling. The perfect balance, there's no perfect balance. The perfect balance between the two is recognizing that you need to balance, balance the two. Okay? I didn't disappoint you guys, right? Good. Thank you. <laughs>